If you're new with us, we've been studying the book of First Corinthians as we love to go through books of the Bible here at IDC, um, but we're taking a break as it has been our pattern through the years to do a short series uh, during Advent, and we've also considered the Psalms before uh, during Advent. It's my joy uh, this morning to kick us off uh, with what will be three sermons from the Psalms, three Psalms that are quoted directly in the New Testament, Psalm 8 next week, Lord willing, Psalm 16, and the following week, Psalm 31. Let's pray as we jump into Psalm 8 together. Father, we thank you for another opportunity we have to open your word, and we pray that you would now open up our minds, open up our hearts. May the truth we see in Psalm 8 uh, lead us to worship, lead us to awe. Uh, we study your word not to make our heads fat, but our hearts right. And so come and do that, we pray now, in Jesus' good name. Amen. Webster defines astonishment as a feeling of great surprise and wonder. Surprise, wonder. Maybe you've been watching a Christmas vacation. As uh, Cousin Eddie says, oh boy, this is a real nice surprise, Clark. Or as Clark says in that movie, Surprise Eddie, if I woke up tomorrow with my head sewn to the carpet, I wouldn't be more surprised than I am right now. It's one of the great lines of Christmas movies, isn't it? But this kind of surprise that I'm talking about today is not something like you see on Christmas vacation. It's something that leaves you in awe, something that leaves you in amazement. This psalm is about that. It's about astonishment. After reflecting upon the majesty of God in, in Psalm 8.1, the psalmist then asks the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? He's in awe that this majestic God is also the mindful God. It's the kind of thing you see about when David writes, Who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you've brought me this far? And it's very important that we, we uh, have a sense of astonishment and awe as we live out this Christian experience. And Christmas is a season in which we celebrate the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And that is also... Uh, then making it a season of astonishment. As J.I. Packer says, nothing in fiction is as fantastic as the truth of the incarnation. Amen. Now, that's important for us because it, it, this can be a sleepy season. I don't know, at least it is for me. With all the music and, you know, you got Hallmark movies and, you know, people falling into the snow and kissing each other and getting married and, you know, the, you know, the typical storyline in Hallmark. Uh, maybe you don't. Don't watch it. It's not any good. Nevertheless, uh, but if you're an actor, I, it's, I'm just playing around here. Uh, it's not in my notes. Nothing that's not in my notes doesn't count, just, so you, just for the record. Um, <laughs> but this is a season in which we're wearing stretchy pants and we're, you know, you, you've, you've got, uh, you know, the tree lit and all of these sorts of things. And it's easy to forget that this is a season in which we ought to be astonished. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as the truth of the Incarnation. Amen. And we need the Bible to give us this sense of astonishment, because if you look to this increasingly secular culture, they will have God shrinking rather than getting bigger, more majestic, more awe-inspiring. And Psalm 8 is given to us to help rekindle this sense of awe and wonder. And if we don't have an awe of God, what we'll do is trade that and have an awe of something else, maybe even ourselves which is no good at all. There's, there's nothing more dangerous than to lose our awe of God. Nothing more dangerous than to be bored with God. If we're bored with God, if I'm bored with God, it, the problem is not with God. It is with my perception of Him. I'm really not seeing Him accurately. And so we go to the Bible day by day, week by week, so that we can see God rightly. And this is a psalm that, that echoes the creation account. It talks about the glory of God in creation as it ponders man's place in creation. But it's also a psalm that points us to Jesus, as this psalm is quoted at least three times in the New Testament. And as Kidner, Old Testament scholar, says, it's quoted because it has implications that only the incarnation, death, and reign of Christ can satisfy. And so I want us to look at the sermon here in three parts. First of all, let's look at God's majesty, and then we'll think about God's mindfulness, and then we'll go to those New Testament passages and think about God's Messiah. So first of all, God's majesty. You notice how the psalm begins and ends the same way. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic, that is, can be translated excellent or beautiful or splendid. How beautiful is God's name. How splendid is his name. When the Bible speaks of God's name, it speaks of his character, his essence. How beautiful is the nature of God? How excellent is the being of God? 
we don't have words to accurately and adequately express how amazing our God is, how majestic is his name, not just in one little confined geographical location, but how majestic is his name in all the earth. Our God is not a little tribal deity. He's not a God you can put in your pocket. He is the majestic God over all the earth. We just sang about how Jesus will one day receive the praise that he deserves from every people, language, tribe, and nation. O Lord, our Lord. He uses two different words for Lord. First word is Yahweh, the covenant name for God. But the second word, Adonai, means master or ruler. That this God that you can have a relationship with, is a, who is the covenant God, is also our master. And when you know this God rightly, you happily submit to his lordship. And that's a remarkable thing about the God we're, we're talking about in this message, is that he's not only majestic, you can actually know this majestic God. He's our Lord. We just sing about that, that we have a personal relationship with this majestic God. There was a guy, a pastor, who was telling a story about uh, seeing a, a college friend. They had been uh, in college together at, in Princeton, and he hadn't seen him in a few years, and his friend had played basketball at Princeton. And um, he was talking to him about this idea that you can have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And his friend with a basketball background said, you mean I can play one-on-one -on -one with God? And he said, yeah, something like that. You, you can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. This majestic God, who's majestic in all the earth, is also our Lord. It's our Lord. David goes on then to say something about how majestic he is, saying that he, you have set your glory above the heavens. God dwelling in the heavens, God's glory being manifested in heaven, setting it above heaven. Glory draws attention to the sum of all of God's attributes. Think about his holiness or his love or his justice or his power. All together, it's his glory. His glory, his, his, his magnificence, he's set above the heavens. And this is what our hearts are made for, to behold glory. And the problem with humanity is we trade God's glory for lesser glories. We trade the real God for false gods. Uh, we, we fail to give thanks to this God who is worthy of praise. People think about travel great distances to, to behold what they think is glorious. They'll travel to go watch a concert. They'll travel to go watch their team play. They, there's something about glory. They have rivals in sports, right? They don't want the other team to have more glory than their team. It, it's a whole glory problem that we've got in our souls. I was thinking about it this morning, like, I love coming here on Sunday because my team is never glorious, it seems, on Saturday. <laughs> it's such a great transition to come here and think about real majesty and real glory. And the glory of God is manifested not just in heaven and earth, but notice where David goes next, out of the mouth of babies and infants. What a contrast from this majestic God over all the earth, and the next thing that he talks about are babies. There's so many implications to this, what David is saying here. Such a contrast that his glory fills the earth and yet his glory is echoed in the nursery. Now, you have a lot of opportunity. If glory is revealed, God's glory is revealed in babies, what a great church to be part of. <laughs> you can see glory everywhere in this church. So think about that when you're on child care duty. You're, you're not really doing child care. You're beholding the glory of God. <laughs> Wouldn't that change everything? Yeah. Some of you want to clap. Some of you don't like that point. You're like, no, no, I'm still not sold, pal. I'm still not sold. But it is remarkable to think about that when you are holding a baby, and we'll go here in just a minute, talking about the image of God being in us. This verse is actually saying that out of their mouths, out of those cries, you may not think it's glory coming at three in the morning, <laughs> that the majesty of God is being revealed in the cries of these little ones. And God is doing something with these cries. This is a, a remarkable thought that he's quieting the enemy. Notice what he says in verse 3, out of the mouths of babies and infants, or 2 rather, you have established strength because of your foes. God uses the cries of these babies in some way to silence God's adversaries. God has many adversaries. And one of the ways God deals with them is through these little infants 
that their very being itself and their, the cries that come out of their mouth are testifying to the glory and majesty of God. They can't escape it. So someone who says there is no God, when they're around a baby, the psalm is saying, in, in, a, in a sense, is being put to silence because their very existence is showing off the glory of God. You see, God doesn't need mighty warriors to win against his enemies. He can do that with infants. You see, this is different than me and, me, me and God when it comes to a, a brawl. If I'm going to be in a brawl, I'm getting the biggest dudes I can find. Now, you think a pastor shouldn't be in a brawl. I understand that, and I try not to. But if, <laughs> if the time ever comes, you know, I'm not afraid to throw down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I haven't done so thus far, so don't, don't challenge me because I probably will, will, will cower in the moment. But um, I do travel around the world, and so it's important that you, you know, handle yourself a little bit. But when I'm, when I'm thinking about, you know, I'm going to go in a very frightful place. I need security around me. God never thinks like that. He needs no security guards. He needs no dudes with muscles. He can win with infants. He says, this is who I'm taking with me. I'm going to silence the avenger with these little weak ones. And isn't this what we've been seeing in 1 Corinthians, that God shames the strong through the weak. He shames the, fool, the, the wise through foolish means. He wins through weakness. Think about in redemptive history, the most powerful person on the planet was Pharaoh. And God wins a battle through the leadership of Moses, who at one time was a baby, who God protected and then raised up to lead these people out of bondage. Yeah. Or little Samuel, Hannah thought she couldn't have a child. And Samuel comes forth, and he's the one that anoints King David. Or some 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Mary, this young girl, has a baby named Jesus. And God silences the enemy through the mouth of that infant. It's remarkable how God wins battles through weakness, crucified in weakness, Paul says, but raised in the power of God. Now, Jesus quotes Psalm 8-2 uh, on Palm Sunday. You can read about this. We'll look at it in just a moment in Matthew 21, and it's very interesting what happens. Children are saying praise to Jesus, Hosanna, Son of God, and Jesus essentially says what they're doing is right, and it's in the context of Jesus' enemies who are saying, don't you recognize what they're doing? And they're put to silence through these praises. So, my friends, this idea that God using weak people ought to be a great encouragement to us. No matter how small you feel this morning, or how weak you feel this morning, let me encourage you to magnify the name of God. Because when you do, you put to silence all of your enemies. The devil in his realm is pushed back as we praise God. And let's remember that God uses the weak. If you think you're too weak to be used by God, you've got it, you've got it twisted. You're just the right candidate. God doesn't need, you know, uh, the, the mighty. He's worked historically through the weak. And let's be a people who look after the weak and the marginalized. Let's be those who are protecting children, those who are caring for children. That's why we support groups like IGP that are out in the foyer this morning. Our majestic God's glory is in the heavens and the earth, and it's in the little lives of these children. Now secondly, God's mindfulness. It would be one thing for just to say the top line, our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, but now the psalmist moves to this idea of why should God even think about us? And he assures us that he does when he says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is uh, man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. You can imagine the psalmist being out on a starlit night, just thinking about the greatness of God and thinking about how he created all of this with the work of his fingers, meaning that it was effortless work for God to create everything. If you go to the gym and you see a guy, you know, he's, he's about to bench press, say, 600 pounds, everybody in the gym would stop what they were doing and they would watch this. But what if he did it with his fingers? <laughs> we wouldn't believe it, would we? It'll be all over social media. And God creates the heavens and the earth. It's simply the work of his fingers. Yeah. And when I consider his majesty, David says, 
What is man that you're mindful of us? This word means to remember. What is man that you remember us? You may wonder if God remembers you, if he thinks about you, if he has any thought about you. And this psalm is assuring us that he does. We may wonder, why would God even be interested in us? And yet this majestic God is the mindful God. This awesome God is the aware God. And so when we're feeling like a a speck in this great big universe, remember that you fill God's mind. He thinks of us. And as our understanding of the universe grows in the 21st century, the question, what is man, has become more and more pressing. And without Scripture, people come up with all sorts of bad answers. Thankfully, we have Psalm 8. It's giving us a grand vision of humanity, right? right? That we are to see humanity in the light of the glory of God. And then when we see that, then it impacts the way we treat humanity. So God cares for us. Now notice verses 5 to 8. We see that God has crowned us. He not only is mindful of us, but he's given us a great vocation. When he says, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And goes on to talk about the dominion that we are to now exercise. We've been made a little lower than heavenly beings. This is the, the Hebrew word Elohim, and it can be translated God or heavenly beings or the divine. And hence there are a number of translations of how Engl- the English translations render Elohim. Uh, I don't like the ESV. I like the CSV better because we know from the rest of Scripture what this text is talking about. It's saying that we are made in the image of God. And so the CSV has it better, I think. We're made a little less than God, right? That is to say, humanity has divine dignity. We are stamped with the image of God, no matter what human being you're looking at, regardless of their age. And consequently, they're worthy of dignity and love and care. So it's, it's radically inconsistent to say that you worship this majestic God and then treat God's supreme creation as worthless or of little importance. Every human being, regardless of age, regardless of race, is worthy of our greatest care, our greatest attention. It's why we oppose abortion. It's why we oppose racism. This is why we want to protect human life, treat human beings with great dignity, It's because we see them in light of the glory of God. We are not made, you notice in this text, a little more than an animal. We're actually made a little less than God. Isn't that something? That's the kind of divine dignity that we have been given. And we've been given not just this divine dignity in our nature, but also in our vocation. We've been called to exercise dominion. Here we're echoing now Genesis 1 and 2. All of, the, of creation, you notice he goes through the list there of sheep and oxen, beasts. Rob Barton, who loves the fish, loves verse 8. We are talking about it after the 9. That we've been called to exercise dominion over the fish of the sea. <laughs> fish are amazing. I've never been able to really exercise dominion very well over fish, but some of you are good at it. Uh, this past summer, I was at Outer Banks, and I was, I was driving, and it was early in the morning, and I had the local radio on for some reason, and the guy gave the, the morning fishing update at OBX. <coughs> And he began to describe all of these kinds of fish that had already been caught by like six in the morning. And I was like, this is, it's just amazing that what human beings can do with creation. And it's important because creation can be a dangerous place. I mean, you think about the show Alone. I haven't watched it, but some of you have told me about it and I've read about it. They take 10 individuals and it's like a survival show, right? They, they have to survive in the wilderness with limited survival equipment. Now, why is that challenging? Because nature is not a safe place with limited survival equipment. You hear people today say, oh, we're one with nature. Oh, no, we're not. No, we're not. (laughs) What we are with nature is we've been given a role to exercise so that we might make nature more beautiful and more safe for people to live in. God has given us that vocation. It's a royal status. It's, it's pretty remarkable. In, we, we talked about this in Genesis in our series that in the ancient Near East, only kings were given this sort of uh, you know, noble uh, dignity that they were to represent their God through reigning. But every human being has this kingly status, if you will. We have this royal status of being able to rule on behalf of God. Now, we know throughout history, unfortunately, humanity has failed miserably at this. 
and we're going to talk about this in a second, that the ultimate man, Jesus Christ, will come again, and he will exercise complete, total, and glorious dominion in a new creation. And he will set the world right. This creation that is groaning right now will be at peace and will be there forever. So let's turn now to that idea of God's Messiah. I just want to make two obvious points from the New Testament, from uh, three passages that quote Psalm 8. <clears throat> what the, the New Testament essentially tells us about Psalm 8 is that how it points to Jesus as Jesus being the, the, uh, the great God and perfect man of Psalm 8 who will reign forever. Now first, think about his reign. Hebrews 2, 5 to 9 uh, the writer of Hebrews is, is doing comparisons to Jesus, showing how Jesus is greater than everyone. And then when he wants to say something about Jesus being the great man, the second Adam, he quotes Psalm 8 uh, in, in uh, Hebrews 2. And then after quoting it, uh, he says there in verse 8, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. That's the incarnation. Only for a little while. Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So you see how Psalm 8 is being put into this redemptive context. That Jesus is the second Adam. He is the head of a new redeemed race. In Genesis 1, this authority and dominion was given to Adam. And here we see that ultimate dominion will be fully realized in Jesus Christ, and he will reign forever. Because Jesus Christ defeated sin, he defeated Satan, he defeated death. Second place this is quoted is in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's talking about the resurrection, and this is what he says there. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then quoting Psalm 8, he says, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Only in Christ do we see the subjugation of everything. And he is reigning now, and he will reign forever. And the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God as all of Jesus' enemies are put under his feet. As we often sing around Christmas, he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And right now the curse is found everywhere. But when Jesus comes again, he will reverse the curse. Paradise will be restored. And all his enemies will be put under his feet. I love how Psalm 110 puts it, that Jesus, uh, as this conquest is envisioned, is said that until I make your enemies your footstool. What are Jesus' enemies to him? Only a piece of furniture. They're just, they're just a footstool. The footstool was, was uh, you know, the way the king got on the throne. He had to get up to that throne. So he steps on the footstool to get up there. Uh, Kimberly and I, several years ago, got to visit Cairo uh, for nine hours. And that was enough time to go to the museum, and we saw King Tut's tomb. And what, uh, what I remember from that experience was hit, we saw his footstool. And it was pictures of the surrounding nations. He had his enemies on his footstool. And I thought, huh, do you think about the enemies of Jesus? Here's what my friend Joe says. God the Father has already decided where his son's footstool will come from, and it isn't Ikea. The footstool under the feet of Jesus will be all the enemies of Jesus. Every enemy that asserts himself against God Almighty, every demon, Satan himself, death, an, in in an inert piece of pedestrian furniture under the feet of Jesus. Sin defeated. It's a prop for the son to mount his throne. Death, it's lost its sting because it's a minor pedestal used for the king to step into glory. No one remembers, he says, the furniture in the throne room. They remember the king on the throne. This is the end of all the enemies of God. They are destined to be a means for the exaltation of Jesus to the place of highest prominence. Do you want to know the purpose of human history? It is designed by the Father as the master interior designer to exalt his son to the place of highest prominence. My friends, we have no need to fear our enemies because you don't have to be afraid of a piece of furniture. That's all they are. This Christ will reign forever. And as Paul says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. We read Psalm 8, we're reminded of God's majesty, his mindfulness, 
The writers take this, remind us of God's Messiah, that he will reign forever. Take that to your troubles today. Apply that to your affliction today. The people of God have a majestic future because we have a majestic Messiah and he's handled our greatest problems. Now the final text that shows us that Jesus is worthy of our praise, not just our trust, the one who's going to reign forever, but our praise is in that passage in Matthew 21 that I've already alluded to. Jesus has turned over the, uh, the uh, money changers and so on in the temple, and he says that his house should be a house of prayer. And then the blind and the lame come to Jesus, and he heals them. Very obvious signs that the Messiah is here. And then the chief priests and, and scribes, the religious leaders, recognize that the children are saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And the response of the religious leaders to them praising Jesus, uh, Matthew says, is that they were indignant. And they say, did you hear these things? And Jesus says, I thought you guys had read the Bible before. He says, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? Now Jesus does two things when he quotes this. Two things happen. First is, Psalm 8 actually happens. It comes true. He put them to silence, his enemies, through the mouths of these children. As they're doing what is right, they have no response. The text simply says that Jesus left and went out to Bethany and lodged there. His sil they're silenced as these kids praise him. Jesus defeats the enemies through the praises of children. It also kind of makes me think about how children tend to say things that are true regardless of the context <laughs> that, that can make us a little uncomfortable at times. They just, whatever's coming to their mind. I remember uh, Joshua bringing a friend to church. He'd never been to church before, and he's raising his hand during my sermon. And he, he, he said, Coach, I got to go to the bathroom. I was like, all right, man, go. You know, like the kids sometimes just say things. They're true. They're obvious. And here, you got a group of kids. They look to Jesus and they say, that's the son of David, Hosanna. And it silences the critics. And the second thing that's implied in this story is that Jesus identifies himself as the Messiah, the son of David, and as of God. You notice in Psalm 8 too, it's slightly different in Matthew because Jesus quotes the Greek version of the Old Testament when the last part of that verse says, you have prepared praise. Out of their mouths, you have prepared praise. He's saying, I am God in the flesh. He is saying, I am being praised just like God is being praised in Psalm 8. These children are praising me because I'm the son of David and the son of God. Or as he said elsewhere, behold, before Abraham was, I am. So my friends, there's a lot today to be astonished by as we think about the majesty of God over all the earth as we think about the fact that God is mindful of you and I, and as we think about the fact that God sent the Messiah, the one who crushed the enemy at the cross and who's going to come again and put all his enemies under our feet. Jesus is coming again. So we celebrate this Advent, what he has done, and we look forward to the day in which he comes again in power and glory. Let's pray and ask the Lord to apply these things to our hearts today. Father, we thank you for your word. May we be freshly amazed this morning at who you are and what you've done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fill our hearts afresh with what Jesus will do in the future when he comes again. We say with the church, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your good name. Amen.